And now we wait briefly. Not inappropriate given Metal Gear. <laughs> we are I'm still sitting. live. Yeah. yeah. No, it's cool. I, 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 I feel comfortable telling people that, you know, I sit inside a cardboard box for hours. Is and, it and your, de is it your destiny? Gear. It is my destiny, yes. No. I didn't see the, the confetti you were talking about in like the MGS5 promotional bits talking about popping out of the box. I mean, I'm very excited about popping out of the box, but Oh yeah, me too. Oh, that's 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 super exciting. And I actually need to, need to go back and review re re view, rewatch this that. Rewatch that because either it's confetti when you pop out of the box or it's uh visual artifacts on a low res video playing over my monitor. So, one or the other. <laughs> So, uh, um, hello, Robbie. Hello. Hi, Robbie. Hello. So, uh, go, go ahead and introduce you. I think me and James will briefly reintroduce ourselves for anybody who's just tuning in for MGS4. Uh, but go ahead and introduce yourself first. Uh, I'm Robbie, dude. Hello. Uh, I played a whole bunch of Metal Gear Solid 4, and I really like the story of that game. That's <laughs> <laughs> pretty much why I'm here. Uh, well, I'm Austin. I write haptic feedback, and um, you know I've written about Metal Gear Solid One before, and I've uh, written a little bit about the series as a whole. And I will probably, honestly, end up writing a lot more in the future, just because there's so much to talk about, honestly. And uh, James, go ahead. Uh, yeah, my name is James Clinton Howell, uh, at Legion uh, around the internet, uh, author of the uh, essays "Driving Off the Map" on Metal Gear Solid Two and "Monstrous Births" on Metal Gear Solid Four. I uh, actually had the pleasure of providing uh, additional localization support for Metal Gear Solid 4. Uh, and uh, so, obviously, I have a fondness for that game for a number of reasons. So, uh, you know, I had no idea actually where to start with this panel. But I think I'll just go ahead and start off kind of like with the, with the, the, uh, with one of the ending points of Monstrous Birth, mm -hmm. the essay about MGS4, which is essentially that MGS4 is full of references to the previous Metal Gear Solid games, obviously, and I feel like uh, those are often um, those are often construed as like a sort of as a sort of fan service just to the people who have been staying to the series so long, and perhaps that's a legitimate interpretation. But when you wrote this essay, you suggested that uh, a lot of the ways that the get that the game remixes these tropes uh, suggests a kind of theme of, of like disease and death. And it suggests a kind of like a, a you know an oldness to the entire series in the kind of way that that Snake is old himself, and that it's essentially that this series is kind of clinging on for life in the same way that that Snake is himself. So I felt like that was an interesting point to start on. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, obviously I agree because I, I wrote I wrote it, but <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, uh, no, yeah, it's it's like they're they're one of the things about Metal Gear Solid 4 is that it's, uh, to use Otacon's term, it's, uh, as it goes on, it, it feels like more of a schlep for Snake, because he's like, he's just got this huge burden on his back that he's carrying through defeat after defeat after defeat, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, all the references, uh, the, the, the wrong characters are mixed with the wrong scenes, you've got Johnny on the ground banging his Beating head. his like, head, the, yeah, that was the one I was going to bring up first. <laughs> Yeah, like yeah, because it's an iconic moment after the after the uh, the fight in Metal Gear Solid One against uh, Gray Fox or the Cyborg Ninja, when he starts going nuts and needs whatever medicine he takes to keep himself from wigging out, and he starts banging his head on the ground. He can do that because he's got an exoskeleton. Johnny's just got he's an idiot, and he just wang oh. Oh God! And it's 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 kind of a humorous way of hitting up what one of the major the 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 mo of that game is, which is that uh, here's the reference. Here's the wrong character. This character is not capable of 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 fulfilling this reference. So it's kind of like it's kind of like what MGS2 to Raiden did to Raiden, kind of fulfilled on a huge grand scale to where. It's it's not just the protagonist is the wrong character. Well, I mean, the protagonist in this case is the right character, but it's just like right. every single character in that game is doing the wrong thing and for the wrong reason. And the thing about it is that, and the thing about it is is that this is kind of a self conscious discussion of the state of the series itself, where it's like it's like these are the characters that are left alive, and they have to play out these tropes that make up a Metal Gear game, and so that's what they do out of out of a sense of duty almost, you know. 
Right, and a uh, sense of duty is kind of appropriate because, like, the very first, the very first sort of misassociation is right at the start when, um, after after the uh, you know the intro sequence with uh, the gecko and running around with the AK and and the soldiers dying and stuff, um, you know, the very first there there are these little flashback sequences that are uh, you know nominally to they're called flashbacks so nominally that means that they're designed to remind you of things but it's like why would you remind me of big boss or, or naked snake saluting at the grave of the boss with solid snakes saluting at the grave of who now which is which i think it's at the grave of big boss himself the supposedly marked grave of big boss and i think that's interesting because i'm pretty sure that's actually the first one in the game now that i think about it yeah yeah it was it was actually weird for me. Um, the first time playing Metal Gear Solid Four again, it was it was when the flashbacks came up. It was really confusing to see um, them use Big Boss in the image of Solid Snake for what just seems like oh he's doing the same pose as Big Boss. But uh, as I read as I read uh, Austin's article, it it became uh, it became more and more James's article. James's article. Excuse me, I'm so sorry. Uh, it became it became more and more apparent that it actually meant something as the game went on. Yeah, that's and that that's that's my that's kind of like from the previous panel talking about critical approaches and in terms of like my preferences to create a kind of uh, to create a uh, a critical bubble that uh, uh, that is self consistent and can handle the questions of well what does this mean and of that of a different context and that was like one of those tests of the of the thesis which is like uh, well okay well uh, why does this reference look like something else that it's actually not representing it's just referring to so yeah that that, that was where that got kind of a head start right and uh, so that's so, so that's kind of the main theme of this game is essentially uh, is both as a uh, it's it's well, one, it's it's a, a lot of it's a lot of self-reference and self-commentary, which is why, especially a lot of people who haven't played uh, the other Metal Gear Solid games, don't find it nearly as compelling. Because if nothing else, they're completely lost because they don't understand these tropes and such. They haven't played the other Metal Gear Solid games. But it also provides uh, a lot of the dis uh, um, yeah. It kind of prov it, it kind of pr provides a, a sort of real world thematic discussion as well of kind of like this recycle this recycling of violence this this re repetition of conflicts that have that have emerged and reemerged in different formations throughout history uh, past the long past the point at which they make sense you know yeah definitely and uh, there, there's there's so many interest there's so many other interesting things I wanted to bring up which is uh, um, I think I wanted to start with a question that that actually Monstrous Birth doesn't really cover because it was so uh, important to uh, how you interpreted Metal Gear Solid Two and how I ended up turning interpreting Metal Gear Solid One as a result. I wanted to ask you: um, Do you think that Metal Gear Solid Four does anything really um, meaningful with the camera? Because a lot of MGS Two was we use the camera to at, at various times in her, uh, you know, in, uh, inhabit Raiden's body, you know, if nothing else to assist us with first person shots. And in MGS one, we use the camera a lot to like look over a wall or see past the wall in a way that snake can't. Uh, and those are both important to MGS one and MGS two structure, but MGS four kind of sticks with the behind the back camera. And it even kind of seems to set in the middle between the third person camera and the first person camera with it's like kind of older over the shoulder perspective. And I was wondering if you had any particular thoughts about about if MGS4 is a commentary of any of all the previous games before it, is it saying anything about the previous games before it with that decision of camera choice? Well, I think that that I mean that decision of camera choice it sort of underscores the the fact that uh, you are at war. The other camera, the cameras in the other games, you're either you know you have to go into first person view. Um, and very carefully aim. You're not moving. You're not able to move. I mean, you can lean left and right, but that's not going to make any difference as to whether or not the enemy, uh, like when they're shooting at you, if they hit you. Um, but the fact that the camera does tighten up over the shoulder in kind of a Gears of War, you know, kind of a, a third person version of a first person shooter game uh, approach. I think that that underscore, and the fact that Snake is fluid, he's mobile, he's he has, you know, he's he's now got all these moves that characters from a lot of other games that uh, uh, have developed as a as a uh, what's become an industry standard. But in the context of the Metal Gear series, I think that the fact that 
I think the fact that that is an action camera uh, is, signifies that you are in a battlefield. You are going to be. I mean, you're you're in a position where you have to fight and you have to kill. And uh, obviously, going for like a you know, like a big boss rank on the boss difficulty, uh, you know, you try not to, and that's arguably. I mean, for me, that this is like the single. This is like the Metal Gear game that I have not gotten the big boss ranking on because just trying to negotiate so many of the environments using uh, uh, with set pieces and level designs that are so meant for you to be fighting through. Um, I have I have difficulty sort of like re. Even if you're unseen, that. yeah, 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 exactly. And you're kind of you're kind of meant to fight through the battlefield, but no one is supposed to recognize you as Solid Snake. That's that's kind of a lot of the structure of that game. Yeah, yeah. The the only other camera thing I would point out is that when you go in, when you have the Octo Camo hood and you pose on in certain statues in Act One and also in Act Three, the It'll camera zoom the old camera. Yeah, it, it, the, the camera will get fixed, and I kind of think of that as just like a visual reinforcement of what Snake is doing. You know, I'm a statue, camera, I'm a statue. Right. I think that was actually, that that reminds me of a thought that I that I never wrote down for whatever reason that I had maybe a half a year ago, which is that um, the other thing about MGS, MGS4 being that it's kind of a, com, you know, like a... The, one of the big motifs in it is that there are kind of like these these infestations of characters like uh, with with pieces that don't necessarily belong to them. There's there's Johnny, you know, banging his head on the floor because he's reenacting he's reenacting uh, the cyborg ninja, Gray Fox, when that doesn't make sense. But there's also um, there's also the big theme of like um, characters taking on like new uh, like prosthetics and technological parts as a way of like representing these kind of like semi uh, these kind of like parasites elements to them uh, like the nano machines for example being the huge being the huge and mimetic example of that you know where it's just like these uh, these nano machines are keeping a lot of these characters alive for the most part especially Naomi and then there's characters like ocelot or old snake himself who are using pieces of technology like ocelot's prosthetic arm or snake's uh, sneaking suit to like help maintain their physical structure you know like for for ocelot to keep his arm and for snake to keep his uh, to keep his muscles essentially and yeah. uh, um, I, the thing that made me go, the, the thing that made me interested in that was how uh, how the mechanics of MGS4 changed, uh, because it, it was a very radical change from MGS3, even when you consider how subsistence changed the camera from the original Snake Eater, uh, because it adopted a completely new set of controls for aiming and shooting and that sort of thing. And the common and the thing that a lot of people said that they didn't like about MGS4 was that this represented a kind of shift towards action, and it does. Uh, and I think that's because it's kind of a, a lar it's part of that larger meta commentary of this is the series as it moves on, as it becomes older and becomes more homogenized, is losing its as losing some of the character that defined the old games because it's being infested by ideas that belong to other series that are not of Metal Gear's characteristics. That's Dan? interesting. I, I I I had not thought of it that way. I was kind of processing that. Uh, but you did want to go off of the prosthetics and nano machines thing. Yeah, there there is one thing. Um, it, it's 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 hidden in plain sight, and I don't think it's entirely appreciated for what it signifies in terms of uh, in terms of Snake. You know, I mean, a lot of it, it really feels like a lot of it, of MGS four is like just this gigantic monkey on 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 Solid Snake's back. So much so that he even loses the. the you know, he even loses his uh, his his well earned moniker of Solid Snake that designates him as the man who makes the impossible possible. You know, that's kind of that's that's who he has been for the whole series. You know, even in the moments when he's like, "I'm no hero," you know, "I'm just an old right. killer" or whatever. Um, but so during the uh, during the game's version of the torture sequence, which is the microwave hallway, which uh, frustratingly you can die during. On yeah. harder difficulties, uh, yeah. But um, you can't die on the easier no, difficulties. Uh, it's harder to, but it's like uh, in, in my experience, I, I I went through and I tested that on a couple of different difficulties, and it's I, f I found that it was faster to die on the uh, on the harder ones. But basically, it's like you know, Snake is in this microwave and he is getting cooked on the inside, and his suit, his his prosthetic muscle suit is uh is 
popping and breaking and, and, and everything is falling apart. And at the very end, he is literally crawling toward the end. And the way that the game emphasizes what's going on with him is that his life meter is down to like 0.1. He has, he has literally one HP. And the only thing that is keeping him going is uh, the, 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 the smidge of a unit that's left on the psych meter, which, it, you know, indicates his, his, uh, his, uh, determination his general mental state so that the idea that you know the the spirit to overcome uh, is more important than physical limitation you know that that's hit up pretty clearly during that sequence but what's not totally made what's not made it totally obvious to the player in a rare instance of understatement <laughs> for the game <laughs> and for the series is the fact that you know, during the during his final fist fight with with uh, with Ocelot, um, you know, his muscle suit, uh, as he tells as he tells Naomi during uh, the South American chapter in Act Two, you know, it's a, it's a muscle suit that helps him get up around. You get to see his body. He's still in he's still in uh, good physical shape for an old man. But I mean, he's, he's, he's his muscles have atrophied. He's certainly not buff anymore but yeah he's he's not overweight he's he's slim he's looking pretty good for if he was actually 80 years old he'd be looking pretty good for a guy who's 80 years old he's technically in shape right yeah, totally totally like jack polance too <laughs> but but yeah it's like during his final fight with ocelot his jumpsuit's busted and it's like so I mean, every when when he's punching, like he does, it's like you know uh, when you punch, you, you use the hip and the shoulder and uh, a lot to to create the impact. You know those parts of his suit are busted; those aren't working. So I mean, he's using old man's strength to not merely <laughs> to not merely bear the weight of the jumpsuit, whatever it is at this point, but also to fight Ocelot. And it's sort of it's it's this sort of like visual reminder that Snake is besides in, in addition to the nano machines that. Oh God! It's such a great moment when they both have the little syringes and they right. look at each other. They make eye contact and they know. I'll come they... back to that. But uh, but yeah. In addition to the nano machines that that sort of deliberately generate a life meter for him. I mean, it's like he's totally fighting off of spirit alone. I mean, that he's got solid snake back, and that's like. And the game uses the heads up display to indicate that, does it not? Don't they return to the? Uh... Don't they use the life meter indicator to, uh, or is that just on, or is that just on Ocelot's side? No, it's on both sides. Uh, it's, right, uh, yeah, because it assumes the old look of the heads-up display, and when it when it go, when it gears up the MGS One music, uh, the MGS One fight music remix, I'm pretty sure it calls you Solid Snake again, and you're not Old Snake again until the fight is over, which is at this point kind of like a which you discussed as kind of a metaphor of everyone casting off the weight of burden that this series has put on them, because it, you know at that point he is Old Snake, he's dying, you know. Yeah, it, uh, exactly. It calls you. It calls you Solid Snake, but if I'm not mistaken, it also calls you uh, Naked Snake at one point during the yes. Metal Gear Solid Three sequence. I think that's significant for a slightly different reason, which is that, um, which is that there is an actual difference between the old Snake and Big Boss character because right. old Snake is is still technically, for example, a patriot, still someone who wants to serve a government and a cause, and that's the different. Like the difference between that and Big Boss is 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 significant because, like, obviously, like the character in MGS three and the character, for example, in MGS four are completely different. You know? Yeah, yeah, totally. Sorry, uh, uh, Robbie, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh no, no, no! I, I was, I was, I was just agreeing. But um, Byronic in the chat also mentions that Liquid Revolt, uh, Revolt. Excuse me, reverts to Ocelot as well. Right, um, because he's casting off the role that he's taken on for himself that doesn't belong to him. Correct, yeah. Yeah, I think the, the convoluted uh, narrative explanation was that, uh, like, at one point, there was maybe the ghost of Liquid Snake in the arm, but then at some point he cut But then off they the revealed arm. that he doesn't even have the arm anymore. Yeah, and It's he, an act. Yeah, and he he had to he had to like use a hypnosis or something to actually trick himself into thinking that he was trick himself into thinking that he was possessed by liquid at some point, which is it's, just it's, it's, great. it's very it's very weird how Ocelot will go through these incredible means to do something that doesn't really matter in the end. Like he will he will Boy, put, yeah, he, will, he will hypnotize himself in order to be another person when he could just pretend. 
Yeah, no, no totally. Well, I but think then that, again, I, this is the man who tortures someone at every chance he gets. Ex- exactly. Like he is a man of ridiculous means. You know, he, he, he's he's a very uh, he, he's a person that will go through great lengths in order to uh, do something that is just you know, it's Ocelot. Like he, that's what Ocelot's gonna do. I think if I'm remembering right, I think that the 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 re, the, the re, rationale. Just keep that uh, for his self self hypnosis is that he had to keep nano machines in his body in order to maintain contact with the system, and he had to do that if he was going to uh, take control of the system. However, putting the nano machines in his body made his sensory it basically made his being known to the Patriots AI in the same way that Merrill's team. You know that she makes a big deal about them sharing senses. So he had to hypnotize himself so that the Patriot AI would not know that he was that he uh, he as Ocelot was actually trying to do this, and that which would uh, which would create some sort of obstruction because it's understood that Liquid hates the Patriots, but it's sort of Ocelot has this ambiguous quadruple agent relationship to them that he needs to maintain. Because I think if nothing else, uh, wouldn't it um, isn't isn't it part of the idea that as Ocelot he would just crash the system anyway? That or, I don't or remember. It, or was he still trying to live out the big boss dream of I'm going to take control of this system and create a soldier's utopia? You know. Uh, I think that would have been. I think that would have been him uh, sort of like mimicking Liquid because Liquid was really hard up on you know. The, on the outer big, heaven thing, yeah, being big boss and 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 surpassing him because snake snake took away his with a flamethrower and a lighter. Uh, I mean, with a hair can of hairspray and a cigarette lighter, uh, managed right. to steal his uh, victory. Right. Yeah, and that was actually that's actually it's something that it's it's interesting how you uh, if you start to analyze it as kind of like an example of like how these characters view this as duty. It's like uh, this is something that happens like. NGS4 just kind of makes it the central idea, but this is something that has been occurring through every Metal Gear title, is is this this sense of, like, I have had this duty cast on me, and it is absolutely my responsibility to see it through to the end, which is like, I mean, it's why, M- it's like, in, in, in MGS2, Raiden straight up says, if I didn't have to be here, I wouldn't be. They sent me here, yeah. you know? And, uh, and, you know, and I think, like, uh, the entire tone of MGS3 is, like, old, like, like, Naked Snake does not want to do these things, but his country has assigned him to do them, and therefore it is, it is, he has no choice, you know, and that sort, and that sort of thing. And of course, that kind of goes back into the meta, the, the meta notes, which is that it's always this, you know, this new, the game designers throwing new conflicts at these characters, and that there's, uh, there's no ever, there's never really any, like, victory for them. But it also, um, but I wanted to come back to that, which is that, which is, this is why uh, Snake and Ocelot put those nanomachine thing, the, the, put the, put the, uh, the, 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 so the syringes in their necks, because, because they still have to finish this fight. They still, like, one of them has to, one of them has to fall to the ground and die for this, for this to be over, you know, they can't just sit there and breathe, you know, so that's, right. so that's part, that's part of why they do it. Another part of that is that uh, I don't know. This is not something I've seen written about. Uh, it might be, and it's just simply beyond my knowing. But Go I, mean, ahead. I see when I, I sort of take uh, the Metal Gear series as a whole. I mean, many of them they're about, uh, uh, with the exception of the relationship with the boss and Naked Snake. Uh, but even but even within that, this is true. The the Metal Gear series games are very much about uh, relationships between men. And uh, oh, different yeah. kinds of, I mean, uh, it, it has overt, you know, homoeroticism in it, but it's also about uh, uh, a rival, a brotherly rivalry, because, I mean, it's uh, literally between Liquid and, uh, and Solid Snake. But even to the point of, uh, of uh, you know, Solidus and Raiden, uh, the young Ocelot and Naked Snake, you know. Fatherly relationships. Yeah, sorry, what? Those are those are all those are all father son relationships of some type, right? And uh, it's like, or like I kind of take Liquid and Solid Snake's relationship to be kind of prototypical of Young Ocelots and Naked Snakes because there's this there is this sort of like, uh, it, it's not necessarily younger versus older brother in the first one, but it's uh, 
I have something to prove and I'm going to prove it by beating you uh, attitude that Liquid takes. And that's the same one that Ocelot takes too, man, because it, it's really crazy because like he, he's actually a little, un, he, he is, he, uh, for all of his quadruple agenting, he actually is a little bit unhinged in that game because of how much he idolizes Snake because there are points where he would have literally killed Snake. Like when Snake jumps off that uh, the the waterfall and Ocelot checks the 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 revolver and sees that the bullet that he's got in there is like it was the next one. So I mean, if right. Snake hadn't jumped, he would have, like Ocelot would have killed him. And then time paradox. But uh, it's it's also interesting that as a flip side of this, the series uh, does some uh, very difficult to defend. Uh, just representations of women a, 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 oh, yeah. a cohort of mine a friend uh, ray hollowell has a series of essays about that uh, going on right now that uh, i think are really well written so if anybody uh wants to check that out uh has uh ray rei hollowell so yeah that's a, a good writing on the series that i think is worth uh paying attention to but yeah the that's that's part of Part of the mo about you know the games are about relationships between men uh, in many cases, and of course a well I'm not sure how responsible it is to be making this kind of speculation, but it's uh, you can't help but wonder because you never heard about Hideo Kojima getting married or anything, so you know. Anyway, what was I going to say? Um, Oh yeah, they, we're just so, there's so much t- stuff to talk about in, in this. So much stuff to talk about in MGS4. Oh, another, I, oh, another. Uh, oh, uh, sorry, someone said something. Oh no, I was going to think again. <laughs> 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 no, that, that that right there, that is Metal Gear Solid pointing at you and laughing, and that is like the best thing. I I I just love it because it is it it is that right there is like. The narrative embodiment of every single practical joke that the Metal Gear Solid series plays on the player ever, and uh, right up to the point where Mount Snakemore rises up out of the ocean. <laughs> Mount Snakemore. That was amazing. Uh, yeah, I know. Like when I saw, like the the fight between, the, I mean, the fight between Rex and Ray was uh, so very clearly like MGS one versus MGS two, and uh, and it's like, and at the end of that weird collision. Uh, you know, ocelot play acts to the whole thing, and just makes basically kind of you get that you get that fulfillment of finally piloting a Metal Gear, and then the game is like, ha 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 ha, you did that. This didn't matter. The the game There's is just like, oh, just kidding. You're gonna fall out of Metal Gear Rex and break both of your arms. Oh god, that was fun. yeah. That was the other thing is just like it's also interesting that that's kind of. Uh... Because the Metal Gear Solid series has so defined itself by defying what its fan what its fans would want. I mean, especially to the point of MGS4 being like, of course, one of the one of the one of the most often thing often read things is just like, why aren't the Patriots like twelve boss fights? You know, like, but right. but so the thing about that is it kind of goes like that would be one of the big fan fantasies, and the fun part about it is that it plays out exactly the way you would want it to. You control that thing, and Metal Gear Rex feels like Metal Gear Rex, and piloting it is yeah. so satisfying. But the thing about that is that it's almost the narrative that it, that that becomes, if in terms of like a conventional narrative analysis, that becomes the point of like uh like the the uh, the, uh, the 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 darkness before the dawn or whatever. I mean, Snake breaks both of his arms, Ocelot gains control of the big ship. And Raiden almost dies, and he loses another another set of arms or whatever. <laughs> yes, and it's actually, and it's and it's like you know, so it's so it's this simple, it's this simple contrast of like this is what you wanted, this is the result, you know, yeah. and that's yeah. and that's of course is that of course defines Metal Gear Solid Two as well as just like. Well, you wanted to play a Metal Gear Solid One again, didn't you? Well, here you go. This is a game that literally creates Metal Gear Solid One from the ground up. Except, wait, that doesn't work. So, literally, the entire thing comes crashing down. Also, everything like... everything in Metal Gear is literal. You know? Yeah, I, I yes. feel like that's the entirety of Metal Gear Solid Four, where it's just like, do you want this game? This is the game that you wanted. Here you go. Snake's old. Like it. It sort of it sort of pulls that game where again, like yeah, you're you're driving in this giant Metal Gear Rex and you're you know, plowing down geckos and frog soldiers and you feel like a real badass. And then again, at the end, you're literally limping with a gun trying to shoot at Liquid Ocelot. 
And then Liquid oh. Ocelot turns back and mocks you as he <laughs> runs away. That part I re- was. I really Go liked ahead. how they. I really liked how they took Liquid Ocelot and translated him into a character in the uh, now now gone uh, Metal Gear Online uh, for that. Because I mean, they they took like so. They they put so much loving detail into the representation of his character in the online game that like uh, where uh, if you with most characters like if you you had this little hop back move you can make that you can also make in the offline game and I believe if you did that with Ocelot Ocelot wouldn't just make a hop back he would start skipping backwards and he would point and laugh at whoever was in front of him it was just great <laughs> but does he do but does he do the finger guns I just want to know that. yes. Yes, he right, does. Good. Oh man, they got to bring that back. He does. He does the finger guns both. And uh, uh, that's actually a weapon. That was actually a weapon in the online game. I'm well, so sad that I did not get to play Metal Gear Online when four was out. I'm I so never sad. played enough Metal Gear Online. Bloody Honey brings up a great. Uh, our our good friend Bloody Bee Honey brings up a great point in the chat, which is that uh, I love how Raiden Ra- Raiden's entire narrative arc is this: the player demanded this, and now you get to see how your insane demands affect his life. It's like, yeah. oops, you wanted Raiden to be a badass ninja, now he's a cyborg who doesn't have human parts under his jaw. And, like, and that's the thing is, to me, is, like, I've also, there's that, there's kind of, like, again, that burden of the saga, you know, which uh, every character eventually has to learn how to cast off, and for Raiden, of course, that means at the end of the game he has his full body back, which we've come used, we've become used to that with Raiden's story arcs. He gets to take off the suit and get his blood back or replace his cybernetic parts with his actual human parts. Um... But the uh, but the thing for me as well is just like that 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 simple mocking of player once was just like this is the Raiden that people probably want if 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 anyone had wanted Raiden the first time to begin with then this is the Raiden they would have wanted except here now you get to watch him be a badass ninja but you get to watch and you get to be an old guy who beats on his back every once in a while when you walk around on your hind legs too much or when you walk around like crouched. <laughs> Right. Yeah, and you have the you have like the arsenal compress to to use to to help you soothe those back pains. Right. I think that's actually now that I think about it, that item is kind of interesting as kind of like a reference to Arsenal Gear and the Patriots because it's kind of like it's literally like this is a uh, this the Arsenal Gear, the Patriots, the things those associations is like this is like holding up your back. It's like a structural note almost. You know, I could be reading too much into that, but I think that's kind of funny. Um, the other thing I wanted to note, which was, uh, the, the other thing I wanted to note, which was, oh man, I had something and then I completely lost it in that dumb Arsenal compress joke. <laughs> oh man. Oh, that's yeah, okay. That fits it. You know, in GS4 is like set piece after set piece after set piece that everything is awesome. I mean, well, I mean, it, uh, well, I think there's something we probably should acknowledge is how divisive uh, the appreciation of the game is. Even among, like, among, among, like, the commercial Metal Gear fandom, I say the commercial, I'm not sure if that's a good way to say it. Among the people um, who have only a surface level appreciation of Metal Gear, it's extremely split. And I found that I was very surprised to find that the critical community that, that has come up around Metal Gear is also incredibly split on it. There are people who appreciate MGS2, but they look at what MGS4 was doing and they just kind of go, this is bullshit, you know? Yeah. It- I, I feel like at, at the surface of Metal Gear Solid 4, it's it's open to a lot of criticism because like like you brought up in your article at the end one of the one of the biggest things that people were you know going on about is how they brought back Big Boss like right at the end. But it, if you look more into it, they sort of needed to like it was something that they needed to do, and it's the way with like a bunch of characters in in the series and going about doing what they actually needed to do in Metal Gear Solid 4. Like, it, 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 in, in the, like, at, at first glance, it's like, why did they do this? It's ruining the story. But in the end, it meant something. And it, with, with the symbolism in the game, it truly, like, adds up. Yeah, yeah, totally. It, it's like, it's, it's kind of doing in reverse. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's undoing the association that was made right at the very start of Metal Gear Solid 3. Because, Here's you know, here's old snake pretending to be big boss, except now he can't do that because here's the actual person. Right, right, right. Yeah, exactly. And it's like I th- you know when we started metal. I think I mean this was my experience when we started when I started Metal Gear Solid Three, and I think I think others think felt this way as well. That it's like okay, it's not not literally Solid Snake, but it's Snake, 
it looks like Solid Snake, and I'm going to feel as good about this character from the start as I felt uh, as I feel about Solid Snake. So it's right. like Naked Snake already uh, Naked Snake already has his character built for him in a sense by the by the player's expectations from knowing who Solid Snake is, even though the characters are 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 differentiated significantly um, uh, over the over the course of events of that game. But with and so, but that what that does is it sort of bleeds Solid Snake into our introduction to who Big Boss is, and because of the fragmentary nature of the references in Metal Gear Solid Four, that's that's kind of one of the roles that that Solid Snake is stuck in is he's stuck in this Big Boss role. So it's like when Big Boss shows up, it's like that's the point at which that first conflation, that first blending of Solid Snake and Naked Snake. At, you know, when the fir- very first time we put our hands on Metal Gear Solid 3, that's tearing that apart and saying, no, these are different, and the these are different characters, and they have different fates and different burdens. It's so. like a salad dressing. Like, it's like Hideo Kojima has been shaking this bottle of vinaigrette or whatever for, for however long, but at the end of it, at some point, some of the, you know, the oil's going to go to the top, and some of the heavier elements are going to set at the bottom, and, like, eventually the segregation that was supposed to exist in the first place will eventually take, come back, and it eventually does. Because they stop shaking the bottle, because, you know, it's just like, it's over. The structure that supports this series, the conflicts that have been driving it for four games, is gone for six games. Anybody? Oh, yeah, that's right. No, that's right, those, those, those six games. Right, Metal Gear 1 and Metal Gear 2. Uh, oh, right, that kind of, going back to the end of it, that reminds me is uh, the, the you had this, the huge section of your essay was was saying that, uh, basically, a lot of your essay was explaining, like, this is, uh, this is referring to this, this is referring to this, this is, like, how this game, like, recombines all of these tropes in these different ways. And basically, then a large part of your essay was, was the defragmentation section, which was a big discussion of how the ending is a slow pulling apart of those elements. Oh, yeah, the ending, uh, the ending is, like, the ending is like bam 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 right let's run through the series and figure out exactly how things were supposed to end it's like you know at the uh, the first ending you get is you know the uh, what ostensibly would have been a if 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 Merrill and Solid Snake did not have to be bound for a sequel the 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 uh the life they might have had after that would you know where they might have gotten married and that's you know Merrill gets her good ending from metal gear solid one except to the guy who can't uh who, who's incontinent um <laughs> and oh, and at the end of you know then it switches over to raiden and uh raiden is got his, he's got his family back and he's he's got his son and so that's the good ending of metal gear solid 2 with of like you know these are for your ears only of, of course appropriately heard by everybody who's playing the freaking game <laughs> um but and then it's like but then it switches over to snake and it's like well what what is the what is snake's ending you know it's like the the self annihilation you know that's like that's like solid snake taking the guilt of big boss onto himself and and you know one of the names for uh one of the names that i think might not be being used anymore. I think I think Big Boss now is going to be called Venom Snake rather than Punished Snake. I, I really think if you, if you have like a Punished Snake, it is it is Old Snake by the end of MGS4. But it's like they you know that punishment doesn't belong to him because throughout the entire thing, despite the fact that you know in 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 terms of the story, the fact that Solid Snake had very few choices in terms of the way he was grew up. I mean, even in the way that he was conceived and made and 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 developed into this uh, this 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 warrior or prowess, that one that what keeps him unique is the fact that he always does struggle with with what is a moral way to conduct my life with the with the lot I've been given. And it's like punishment. See, punishment is like is a, is a terrible way for that to go out for him. And so then Big Boss shows up, and Big Boss takes the death, and the Big Boss takes the punishment. And so that's like, whereas uh, through the process of the ending of the game, MGS one and MGS two defragged, and you got to see those endings with uh, albeit with a slightly different twist because uh, Meryl's marrying Johnny, and and Ryan now actually has a son. Uh, you know, uh, Zero dies, 
Big Boss dies, and then you're left with the ellipsis of Solid Snake's uh, going off into uh, isolation once more, maybe not Alaska, <laughs> but going off with his with the with the only person who has been loyal to him the entire time, you know, Otacon to uh, to to live that out with him. And, and that's uh, an interesting that's an interesting thing. Also, is I found it really interesting when the first MGS five E three trailer had the song. I think it was. I think the song is called "Sins of the Father." Uh, as it's accompanying yes. because because sins of the father is almost the entire narrative of the metal gear solid series at this point something happens in mgs3 and for the rest of the series everyone is dealing with the consequences including people who were not born at the time that mgs3 was taking place these people are born into this world and they inherit this conflict from from old from naked snake and ocelot and bulgan and the boss and whatever and it's just like they didn't have a choice to be involved in this they've just gotten swept up in it and somehow and so that's kind of like what MGS4 does there at the ending is to try and disassociate all of those things in part by killing zero and killing and killing big boss so that the you know so that the end result so that so that the progenitors of that conflict are gone. You know? What you described was pretty much the ending message to Metal Gear Solid 2 as well. Which is not Oh, uh, read the our next sad generation. messy history by its light. Yeah, basically. <laughs> I've always liked that quote. I've always really liked that quote. I, I played that game for the first time when I was a kid, and it was, I, I, I don't know, that was, that was that one always stuck with me. By the way, I wanted to bring up, um, back with the ending of, uh, of the wedding sequence, I love the comparison that you made with love blooming on the battlefield, where it literally bloomed with a battlefield, as in flower petals being shot out of a, uh, out of a, uh, a weaponized tank. I totally forgot about that. No, you're right. That's <laughs> fantastic. There's also like the uh, there's also kind of like uh, don't a bunch of like flowers and stuff. Aren't there like flowers at the kind of like weird digital gravestones when when old snake yeah. infiltrates yes. the, uh, you know, so that's uh, so that's almost possibly indicative of that as well. It's yeah, uh, each... that, that that little room is really weirdly visually dense. You know, it's just like that room was not designed uh, like with any kind of like practical standpoint in mind is like this is the room that hosts the A.I., but all that's all it needs to do. So we're going to put like these weird computer gravestones with these holographic flowers in them, and it's bizarre. It's so, like yeah. it was just made for robots to do cool tricks on top of the gravestone AIs. <laughs> it's just absolutely. It's absolutely. I think that's the other thing about it, about just as MGS two. That's something I think that happens with the series is that as it goes on, it becomes more and more surreal. If right. that makes sense. Is no, no, that, no, no, yeah. Yeah. It's like MGS one kind of had little bits of like, oh well, here's a raven on my shoulder, and now I can't move. And then there was MGS two, was just like there's lines of code coming out of the wall. And then MGS three, you know, there were the ghosts of the people that you killed, including like the pel, including like the vultures that ate the people that you ate, you know. Yeah. And and, uh, and, and then I think MGS four just kind of peaks with certain with certain images. It's just so bizarre, you know. I feel like with with like there, there's always been that sort of sense of magic in Metal Gear Solid. Oh, where it's Metal just Gear like, Solid is definitely magical realism. Like if there's yeah. anything that if there's it, like I, like the word postmodern has been attached to Metal Gear Solid a lot, a lot, a lot. But if there's anything that makes it postmodern consistently throughout the series, it would be magical realism. Like from from, from one thing I thought about though is that especially in Metal Gear Solid One and Two, um, when Metal Gear Solid Four introduces nano machines, I feel like they sort of do it in a very uh, midichlorian way when it comes to Star Wars. Yeah, where it's just like, oh, everything was nano machines. Like that's the explanation. That's the, that's another one of those kind of like unsatisfying answers. Is like Vance right. not really immortal? It's nano machines. You know, yeah. like. And I think that's kind of I think that's also kind of the point is just like it's it's like it, it well one it kind of has to do that as a practical narrative thing to tie up all of these loose ends like if Vamp was immortal the series would be able to continue into the future you know uh, or at least you know villains from villains from the old series could still con uh, somehow exist in the uh, in the future series and considering the fact that Vamp kind of occupies a liquid type role for Raiden in MGS4 then um then that would have been problematic, you know, considering the idea that the series is supposed to have ended. And it was actually like the fact that Vamp stayed alive was one of the questions that was left open at the end of MGS2, which was supposed to make yeah. that ending a little less than satisfying. And of course, the fact that there is a 2D pixel thing of, of, of Vamp in the background of New York, although I've, I've never been able to spot it with my own eyes. Um, 
I was I only me. I was only ever, ever able to find it using the document of MGS2 uh, oh. to to like. Uh, God, I wish I had a copy of that. It's it's uh it's neat. I think uh, you might be able to emulate it, but it's uh it's it's really interesting. It shows exactly how like I mean it's in terms of design exactly how much they they only designed like exactly what you had to see and then you just got this uh, you know it's just like a well, it's a video game level model just hanging out there in limbo but um but yeah um oh, no, yeah, the, that that, sorry uh we'll finish your thought and then i had something i wanted to go on oh no i was gonna say that uh i think you're right i think that there is a lot of there there's a lot of density in the uh in in the server room uh on top of the fact, in addition to the fact that it is referencing visually, if you look at the map, it's referencing 2001, the Space Odyssey, with the yeah. process of uh, moving along a spine. You know, all those little hallways that you fight through the uh, through the through the uh, dwarf gecko, um, uh, like a spinal column, up to uh, up to the, the the top node, and it's like the continuation, the heart of the entire struggle is this division point between Zero and Snake, which was how they both responded to the boss's death and how they both responded to the boss as an influence in their lives uh, in terms of character development. And so it was really like that point where the boss being dead <laughs> was like the point where he and Zero divided. And you don't have any image of snakes saluting there you have uh you have the presence of zero his his uh his his proxy you know in a sense to use the language of the game and the, his proxy there in the form of the ai it's it's kind of like if solid snake was before if and, and so in the sense that big boss at the end actually performs a salute at the grave of the boss at the end that's like zero's version of that same event in that room it's like his proxy his presence in, amid the boss's grave and, and it's it, worth it, it, and it's worth noting too how if this is a if you're moving through the body of of this arsenal gear if you're moving up to like if you're moving into the heart of it it's worth noting how the uh how that draws a, a, another parallel to mgs2 which was that you were moving through the anatomy as well you were moving through the uh oh, through yeah, the, the right. jejunum the jejunum and the colon and that sort of thing yeah um the other thing i wanted to i think uh the other thing i wanted to bring up uh, oh god we've got 12 minutes there's so much to talk about um I think another another thing I noted with you on Skype, James, was was also about how this uh, the game also partially makes this point of stale of, of the of the series becoming stale and needing to end by putting Solid Snake stories, Old Snake story, in the middle of like at least two or three other stories, which one might consider more interesting. I talked about, for example, how like Raiden is all of a sudden this appealing character who like boy, it would be great if I could take control of him and do all that ninja stuff. And then there's also the uh, like uh, Merrill as the commander of Rat Patrol or whatever, and so it's just like right. these are these are like these new stories form. There's like these new stories that are forming on the fringes of MGS4 that like your presence is kind of like this elephant in the room that is preventing those stories from going forward as their own things. Even with the presence of someone like Drebin, like Drebin is a character that we'll probably never see again, and they're probably one of the best parts about Metal Gear Solid 4. And with that character there, you know, sort of existing and having all this unknown backstory who automatically knows everything about the B&B, &B, like, it's, 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 it's weird that, like, Old Snake is sort of teaming up with them, in a sense, where it's like, it, I, I feel like Drebin has like a lot of you know stance and as a metal gear character but again like it's it's sort of just like something on the side that seems a little bit more interesting than what old snake is doing it's also weird uh, how but, uh james go first oh uh, i was gonna say i think that that at the end of it all uh despite the fact that despite the fact that MGS4 is uh, has you know iteration and reiteration and reiteration and remixing uh, uh, to use Drebin's phrase crush mix burn um, as its theme. It ultimately winds up pre performing something that is that that the other three games do not succeed at. One of the things that I uh, there's an article like I 
wish I could remember it. Uh, remember the author of this, but uh, it was talking about uh, Im implied political ideology in video game and in video games. And the point that it brought up was that most video game storylines are inherently conservative because they're either um, throwing uh, attention back to a golden age, uh, uh, an Edenic golden age, in, in a lot of fantasy RPGs that you're striving to preserve or to to to. To, Especially to bring Dragon back. Quest. Yeah, Dragon Quest was one of the big examples of that. Sorry, uh, go ahead. I've got, I, I could talk about that topic for days. Sorry. <laughs> but but in the uh, in the Metal Gear Solid series, it's also very true as well. I mean, it's like uh, you are in, in in each instance. In in each instance, there is a crisis whereby these world powers uh, have a balance of power. And they still have, you know, hegemony over over all the, uh, you know, over developing nations and the fact that the nations have to be developing if they're going to play ball in the same world that the superpowers have created. Um, and in each instance, S Snake always represents the always is the is the, the status quo. He's the stat yeah he's the status quo and he is he is the agent of the Patriots in every instance. And it's like you're diffusing. Of the you're, uh, when you the player diffuse the conflict as a player playing a video game in the story, you uh, the, the characters have preserved Order. the power control of the patriots that they're nominally trying to free themselves from. And at the MG at the end of MGS four, you actually, I mean, Solid Snake actually does that. Even though he was an agent of the patriots, he wound up. Uh, almost by accident, destroying them, and that's 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 where it, it succeeds in being uh, a, a really a less conservative game. Although it can be argued on the other end that it is conservative because it returns us to a golden age before nano machines and the patriots were guiding all of our destiny. So you can make the argument the other way as well. I would have interesting things to say about that because I've I've also become interested in the idea of of Metal Gear as as political text because there's there's uh, I mean. For one, its politics about war, its particular version of pacifism, is actually pretty radical. Um, it kind of suggests that it kind of suggests that all conflict, all conflict of any kind, is meaningless, and that the participation in conflict for any ideological reason is somewhat meaningless. And it's like it's it's this kind of like non-ideological pacifism that that is is uh that's kind of inherently leftist when you compare it to when you compare it to you know a, a, a right-wing kind of war hawk type idea but but it's just uh it's it's a particularly radical form of pacifism and i find that interesting when you match that to the fact that uh MGS always presents war as uh well, especially MGS4 it presents war as a kind of result of economies um you know, like like there's literally the war economy in MGS4 as like this expression of how markets can drive conflict because of, because war is profitable. But also, and that's, I mean, and that's kind of a metaphor for the series itself. Like, you know, the more games we make, the more money we make, et cetera, and we're selling armed conflict in our game. But yeah, no, and uh, the the other the other game that I can think of that had you know, economical elements in it uh, that as a, as a driving force would have been Metal Gear 2, which in the original release had just like this big clunk volume info dump about the world, which is just great because it's like, I mean, if you want to know exactly what's going on in the world politics at the time of Metal Gear 2, here's a big old document to, to, to sate your <laughs> curiosity. But I mean, it was, it, 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 the, the crisis, one of the crises that, uh, I, I don't even think they knew that it was Metal Gear, that there was a Metal Gear there at the, the beginning of it, if I'm remembering correctly, because... No, you specifically... were just, you were saving Keo Mark because he developed Oilix, which is supposed to, uh, which is supposed to, uh, be a huge environmental thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, it's like, calling it Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake is like, you know, Solid Snake would, did not know there was going to be a Metal Gear involved when he started that, you know? He was, it was, it was, it was economically, uh, uh, driven because this this emerging power now suddenly had uh, infinite resources that, that would imbalance the economic and liquid power. snake and liquid snake in MG, near the end of MGS one notes that by taking certain actions with their access to nuclear weapons he makes explicit note of how this will affect the stock market and this is especially this is a this is true with solid snake and MGS two as well he plans on freeing Wall Street like he's this kind of weirdly libertarian. 
um, a figure who's like, I'm going to free the bankers, essentially, and it's just like all of their wealth and such will be out of the control of the Patriot system or something like that. I, I don't want to alarm anybody, but we do have five minutes left. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. I, I, I am. Too. Hello. I, 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 I am. I am God's loyal servant to come to tell you that you have <laughs> nearly run out of time. It is almost five minutes to the end of your panel. If you want to make cool. conclusions, I think this is, the, this, this is the point where uh, the uh, theme song to Metal Gear Solid Three should start swelling up in the background. <laughs> <laughs> what? Is, I, I hate that so much. Why they do that? Uh, it was. It was silent, and then it wasn't. If it was. If it stayed silent, it would have been great. Oh. If, okay. if no one has Whoa. if no one has questions, I actually do have like a small question myself, but but I'd always if anyone um, else has something. Okay, Zolani, can you ask your question? But can we get ten minutes instead of five? <laughs> well, 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 the thing, the thing is, we can't because because the thing about it is that Kirby Kid is going to come on for the interview actually around ten o'clock, around four minutes. So, so 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 I'm challenging you, Austin, to do this short. You gotta you gotta go on time. All right, um, all right, I'm hit me, Zolani. I'm interested in this idea of punishment. You're talking about Metal Gear Solid 4, and I'm interested in, like, whoa, this is actually, like, pretty neat. Like, so, like, I'm interested in, in this concept of, of punishment um, and, and its relationship to paternalism. The, the, this, and, and, like, there's a connection between paternalism, between how Sins we conceptualize war, um, you know, how we conceptualize war. Um, um, what's it called? Franz Fanon once, once noted that um, every, every single part of our society is a manifestation of the family. Right, that the state is manifestation of the family, that, that the classroom is manifestation of the family, right? That the teacher is the parent, right? Um, and and that and that Metal Gear Solid Four seems to to imply a kind of paternalism with this understanding of punishment, that that the snake is constantly punished by who and stuff like that. I'm just I'm interested in that particular idea. I want to know if, if there's if there's anything conclusive and and hard line that you could say about Metal Gear Solid Four's approach to those particular ideas of that. Let me try it. Okay. If 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 Metal Gear Solid uses um, uses um, like the relationship between Big Boss and the Snakes as kind of like a as kind of a familial relationship, then the kind of relationship that's being represented is a largely abusive one. Um, this is a, oh, this, is a, this is a uh, this is a relationship where uh, the demons of of Big Boss were passed down to his sons, and those demons haunted those sons uh, such that they were involved in a lot of the nasty stuff that he, that the father was was involved in. Uh, so I think that's uh, that's about as concisely as I could answer that without giving you fifteen thousand words. <laughs> okay, well that's actually that's actually pretty perfect. Um, I don't see any questions on the side. We're near two minutes in. Um, I'm going to I'm going to. I've got this. one more thing to say before oh, we end this that, panel. That's totally fine. MGS4 does a lot to deconstruct and defragment the uh, the Metal Gear Solid series that that it was that was inevitably building up to MGS4, and I think one of the big, the biggest and most repeated criticism of it is that the ending is an hour an hour and a half long cutscene. One, this had to happen because it had, as James said, to reassess the endings of Metal Gear Solid One and Two uh, to give those endings the right place that they deserve. But I also think it's worth noting that as it pulls apart this series and as it kind of promises the idea that there will be no more Metal Gear Solid games, there will be no more games starring Solid Snake, it very simply takes you out of playing a video game. It simply says, you are no longer playing this video game. You are watching this video game because this video game is over. That's my closing thought. James, uh, Robbie, anything? No, I can get behind that. I think that that's uh, that's a very fitting outro because Solid Snake is being taken away from the player in a way that uh, they might not have wanted, but that's what you get. And uh, yeah, I think that's a I think it's a I would I would get behind that reading of it. It it it, it does a really good job at uh, closing everything that it needs to close when it comes to Solid Snake story. Um, closing statements. Uh, Raiden's mocap actor is also the mocap actor for Little Gray, the monkey. Nice. And, uh, there, there. <laughs> and there you have it. Metal Gear Solid 4 is a great, great game. Thank you very much, James, for joining me. Thank you, thank you, thank you to Robbie for joining me. Uh, my thank name's you for Austin. the invitation. And uh, up next, we will be having an interview with Kirby Kid, and then at some point, we will also be having a panel with uh, Zoya Street about norms, 
possibility and permissibility in video games based on that, the work of uh, Shinji Matsunaga and uh, Masayuki Hambalik. That is going to be a good panel. That's going to that happen on be a very good panel. You want to watch that. You do like, want to like watch it. Oh, and it's and probably going to be really long, too. <laughs> well, I'm just going to promise you. We put it at the end, so it might it might go a bit long, so you want to check out both of those things. Um, Of course, thanks to all of you. Um, thanks for listening. Because all of you made Metal Gear Solid 4 way more interesting than I, than I even thought it was. Um, <laughs> And I was like, wow, yeah. this is... Well, this, well, I'm sitting here thinking, that's what I asked the question, because I'm like, this, wow, this game is, 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 is pretty, you know? That's cool. So, I mean, again, thanks to all of you who are watching. Um, We are not done. We will be right back with an interview. Make sure you go on to Indie 4 to check out some really, really good, our last great pedal critical panel. And stick around here for some interviews, and you're watching Indie 3, and we will be right back. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for having me on, y'all.